Hi, I'm Tom Rue of the Coffin Foundation. In today's episode of Top of Mind, we're on location at the shared kitchen of the Innovation Center in Independence, Missouri. You know, this shared kitchen is really a great example of a growing trend that's happening in the country of food incubators and, and large kitchen facilities that are supporting the entrepreneurial itch from people. I think some of this is coming from, you know, uh, college and universities that are actually offering programs like University of Nebraska or Oregon State. Um, as a matter of fact, even just recently, uh, it, it not being just limited to food, there was a new brewery called, aptly enough, you know, the Brewery Incubator in Houston that just opened its doors. Um, Confluence, you know, to other programs that you've heard on top of mind, they were actually funded by Kickstarter. So watch for other trends. But here today, we're going to meet with Stephanie Zamora, the director of the Shared Kitchen. And with any luck, certainly judging by the smell, we're going to get in the back of the kitchen and meet with some of these great entrepreneurs that are doing really cool stuff in a space that people might not think about as often. This is Top of Mind. I'm here with Stephanie Zamora, director of the Shared Kitchen at the Innovation Center. Stephanie, thank you so much for making time for us today. Oh, thanks so much for coming out, and hopefully we send you with some good tasty treats to oh, remember us by. I, I have no doubt. Uh, the few times we've already, like, you know, seen each other, you rarely show up uh, empty-handed. That's true. Um, so this is exciting for Top of Mind viewers and myself because we're doing a field trip, in essence, and we're going to be getting to the back into the kitchen here in a minute to meet some of the foodpreneurs that are going on there. But I thought for the viewers of Top of Mind, we might start with, you know, sharing a little bit of, like, what the motivation was around setting up the shared kitchen in the first place. Like, how did that come into existence? Absolutely. Uh, with most entrepreneurial endeavors, um, there's typically a problem that it's meeting. Whatever it is that you're creating is meeting. And that's exactly what this project was all about. Um, this building that we're in now used to be an old hospital and at the height of the hospital had employed over a thousand people. We're in a little bit more of an economically challenged part of independence, so creating economic uh, impact in this area and getting business happening again was really, really important. Um, so when we took the opportunity to look at the different spaces here in the kitchen, or sorry, in the, we took the opportunity to look at the different spaces here in the building, uh, we looked at turning our old kitchen, which had been used for mass food production, into a business incubator, uh, where people who had never thought that owning a food business would be possible for them because of the capital uh, expense required for building out a commercial kitchen um, really provided a really interesting opportunity for us. There was no other shared kitchens in uh, the Kansas City metro at the, at the time. And as you all know, Kansas City is a great place to get great food. Well, you know, the, in preparing for this uh, episode of Top of Mind, you know, you're right. There hasn't been this notion of kind of shared kitchens, industrial kitchens, mm -hmm. uh, food incubators, if you will. It's kind of a newer phenomenon. Like, did you do research into that idea, or was it more like serendipity that the hospital had a kitchen and you were looking to repurpose the space, and Absolutely. so you connected with that idea? Absolutely. It, this project was all about taking something that was existing and finding another useful purpose for it. So there wasn't a whole lot of research to make sure that we could support such a large kitchen. We have the second largest kitchen, uh, shared kitchen in the nation. Um, with five kitchens, and we can support a lot of businesses here at the Innovation Center. That's really saying something to be, you know, the top one or two in the country. So, all right, you did what a lot of entrepreneurs did, right? Mm -hmm. you, you had a hunch. Yeah. You jumped in with both feet. We sure did. So, well, when did it start? Let's get that October on. October 2010 uh, was when we opened our first kitchen. Uh, when we opened the kitchen, uh, we had three clients right from the get-go, and the floodgates just opened. All right, that's what all I want to talk things, about. Yeah, all the things that we say, like you need to make sure that right. there's enough. They, you need to, you know, test your market. All those things that we teach our entrepreneurs that I harp on with my entrepreneurs regularly, we didn't do. Um, and fortunately for us, it worked out. Um, in the last three years, we've had over 300 requests from people who are interested in starting food businesses. So we've had no shortage of applicants. Um, and so we've really taken the opportunity to take that large number of prospective entrepreneurs and then create the space that they need to be successful. So, I mean, speaking of being successful, mm -hmm. you know, you've got this kind of uh, wall of fame behind us. Absolutely. I mean, 
I, I, I can smell. I can't wait to get in the back in the kitchen because the smell is just driving me crazy. Um, it, this is not insignificant. You it's know? not. So how many like active clients are using the space right now? Well, as any new startup does, they you learn a lot as you uh, get started, especially because we didn't have a lot of that prior research done. Um, we took in a lot of clients in the beginning and actually since our inception have been home to over 67 uh, startup businesses. Currently, uh, we are home to over 30 businesses um, at all different various levels of startup. So some brand new ones that are maybe just a couple years old or months old, all the way to our oldest client, which is just three years old. They started right with us. No kidding. So if you were looking into your crystal ball for the, the, the future of the kitchen, you know, do you see it kind of staying at its size or is there any conversations to increase capacity to take on more, you know, tenants and clients? Absolutely. Our ability to increase capacity comes down to our equipment and the equipment that we have available to us. Um, because we have such a large kitchen and our program is designed to help them get their feet on the ground here and then grow out to a new facility, we'll have a revolving door. So uh, we've had a couple of graduates now that have left spaces uh, in our kitchen. So uh, Sweet Tooth, opened a bakery out in Blue Springs, and then our most newest graduate is Milk and Honey. Um, oh, when they the left, macaroons. the French macarons, Ugh. they're divine. Um, but when they left, they left some space. So we are looking for the next round of foodpreneurs that are ready to help take their space. You know, you, you mentioned the, the growth of that area. Like, you know, have you received support in the community from other, you know, organizations, economic development groups? We have a very small staff. Uh, we have a staff of one. Most incubators are staffed by three people. Um, so we rely very, very heavily on our partners. Um, we uh, have to give mention to Midcontinent Public Library, which has um, powered our business incubator with the business resources that are at the library. So you can go back to the kitchen, log in on our computer like you're at the library. Really? We've got a librarian who comes by once a month um, to actually do one-on-one -on -one counseling with our businesses, help them access that much needed research that will help them do business faster, easier, and lose less money. Um, we also partner with the Small Business and Technology Development Center at UMKC. They have a satellite office here. Uh, we work very closely with all of the KC SourceLink resource partners. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we have two clients that are looking at exporting their products to China and Brazil. And so as needed, we'll pull in those exporting resources um, to help meet their needs. Because we are such a small staff, we have to rely on all of our partners like William Jewell College, Graceland, and all of these other um, programs that we use to help pull in resources for our clients. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think this is a perfect example of that you know, community overlay, one supporting Absolutely. the other. And again, as I look back at these, these wall of products, you know, these are real companies mm -hmm. that are, are uh, being built. I think, as a matter of fact, we're meeting with one uh, later uh, in the kitchen who went from I think in the last three, four months, if I got this right, they went from one employee to now 13? 13 employees. Um, when you look at the overall economic impact um, that's been created by the kitchen, currently we're employing over 45 people. Really? With the smallest incubator staff in town, more more clients. And what it comes one down staff, to... One staff, 45 employees being supported. Absolutely. And what it comes down to is that entrepreneurial community like you referred to. Um, I used to work for KC SourceLink, and so I pull in the, that KC SourceLink network as much as possible to supplement what we're able to do. Oh, if yeah. not, I couldn't do it. Honestly, Tom, I couldn't do it by myself. Yeah, the work uh, that Maria Myers is doing there with SourceLink and the expansion, and then the recent announcement of the Digital Sandbox that they're all part of. Absolutely. Uh, there's just a lot of great kind of entrepreneurial uh, karma happening here in Kansas it is. City. It is. Well, I got to tell you something. I can't sit here anymore. This smell has been so wonderfully overwhelming. I'm very anxious, like, you know, if we can, let's get back into the kitchen and, and meet some of these great foodpreneurs you got back let's there. Let's go see what's cooking. So we're here on location at the Innovation Shared Kitchen Facility, and I'm with founder of Franny Frank's Coffee Cakes, Jill McEnroe. Jill, first of all, thank you for joining us today in this on-location shoot. Thank you. Um, we're thrilled, and i got to tell you, if I pass out in the middle of this interview, don't think anything <laughs> of it, but the smells in this place are just heavenly. From the cakes you're pulling fresh out of the oven here to other things of hippie chow and, 
and artisanal catch-ups that are happening in this place. It's just crazy. But um, I thought I would start by asking you, you know, how did you come about to found the company? I, I noticed on your website you said it was uh, an accident yes. that you came into business. You know, how does that accidentally happen? Um, very wonderful accident. Um, I just found an old family recipe of my mother's and... Um, had never made a coffee cake before. Oh, really? So you weren't a baker? Not at all. I'm, a, I'm actually a graphic designer. Made my first coffee cake for my boss. And next, and my husband took one to work, and the next thing you know, I had orders flooding in. Really? Mm -hmm. So just simple, um, unanticipated demand is what really gave birth to this. Yes. Well, okay, it's one thing, you know, to make coffee cakes for the office. It's another thing to say, hey, I'm going to make a business out of this. How did you make that connection, that leap from, you know, I can do these at home to I need to be in a great place with, you know, assets like this to make this on a bigger scale? How did you make that leap? Where did you find the confidence to do that? It started right away. I've always been a very positive person. And the first step, you know, was the recipe, which I had in, in an old dusty cookbook. And... Um, the first thing to do was to name the company because Jill's Coffee Cakes just didn't have that ring to it. So in honor of my mother's recipe, I named the company after her. So that's where Franny Franks comes from. Oh, very neat. Mm -hmm. Now, this really is a family affair as I understand it because yes. not only are you the founder and doing this, but I understand your son Andrew mm -hmm. is part of it. And I'm, for the viewers at top of mind, he's I'm right pointing off there. camera because he's right <laughs> over there. You know, how did you rope your son into this uh, vision of yours, this entrepreneurial vision of yours? I have no idea. He's amazing. He he helps out with everything, and and he's my my um, right hand man basically. Uh, that's it's, it's going to be his legacy, so I'm excited to share it with him. I got to tell you, I'm I'm actually jealous that you have that because you know my kids aren't quite at that age yet, but I think that would just be <laughs> awesome to be able to be in business, you know, with mm -hmm. my children. Um, so now, as you're looking at expanding, and you're already in several retail outlets, you know, how did you make those connections so that you actually had, you know, orders to fill and, and the growth that you're now experiencing? It all started with um, a, a, a retail spot at Independence Center at, at Christmas of last year. And from there, I was at Farmer's, farmers Market, and happening just by accident really you know just networking with people here in the kitchen or people that i've met at the markets has gotten me those prime spots in retail locations hmm. um you mentioned here in the kitchen and we've, we've talked about that in the intro uh earlier this morning uh, i had to sit down with you know stephanie zamora who, who is the director here at the center um I, i'd like to ask you know has there been value i mean is there value beyond just having the equipment. I mean, are you learning from the other foodpreneurs that are here in the kitchen? Do you share, you know, best practices and ideas? Oh yeah, there's a lot of collaboration between the clients here and within the office at the Innovation Center. Stephanie and, and her group back there, they do counseling and they have good ideas for you, you know, packaging and um, your invoicing, everything you can think of, there's help here. So it's, it's helped grow my business in a way that I never thought it would. Well, that's great. Hey, listen, I you know I know I'm keeping you from getting work done. I can <laughs> see these cakes back here that just came out of the oven. Those are incredible. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. Thank you, dear. Hopefully, it wasn't too inconvenient. It's wonderful. And you know, continued success and much luck. And you know, unfortunately, we don't have smellovision vision yet. Uh, but I got to tell you, if you did, the viewers at top of mind would be like I said in heaven right now. I'm here with Greg Perkins, Chief Hippie Baker of Hippie Chow. Greg, thank you for making some time for us today in the thank uh, you, shared John. kitchen. So, you know, I, I quickly figured out on this shoot today that this is an occupational hazard. You know, I, I almost passed out the wonderful smell of coffee cakes. Now I have to sit in front of this. You're enticing us with this incredible offering of what I understand to be a really healthy product. I, I, I wonder if you could start us off on really what, you know, what was your passion and motivation to really getting involved with Hippie Chow and what drove you to this business? 
Well, one of the fastest growing businesses in the United States today is the natural and health foods business. Uh, and for the, all the right reasons. Uh, Hippie Chow was of interest to me because uh, the company has uses outstanding raw ingredients. The ingredients for this product come from various places around the United States. Over 70% of the materials are either sourced or from this area, but they're sourced in from other areas. It is all natural, very healthy. People look at the front of the bag and say, hey, this looks interesting. Then when they turn around and look at the nutrition facts, they go, wow, this is really good stuff. It's good for you. The surprise is when you open it and taste it, you find out what it is. Oh, wow. So you put all that together, and that was what drove me to Hippie Chow. I mean, I, I can vouch for that personally. The, the little bit of uh, serendipity to the story here today is, you know, I was introduced to the product because you already had retail presence mm -hmm. before I even knew of the Innovation Center and the shared kitchen and the work that, you know, Stephanie and her staff are doing here. And then I came here for the first visit and I saw the product and I was so excited. I'm like, I know this product. It is an incredible product. And so it's just a, a point of serendipity. Now, I mentioned that I saw it first via retail. So I know that you have already some uh, very established uh, channels of distribution. But I hear that that might be getting much more ambitious here. Can well, you talk the, about that? Over the last couple of years, uh, the business has grown in the Kansas City metro area. It's been an outstanding growth there. We've done very well. We also are in 11 other states. And in the last seven, eight months, we've expanded the business. One of our clients has uh, outlets in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, South Korea, Turkey, uh, Japan, Thailand. Uh, so Chippy Chow is literally going around the world right now through one of our clients. Now, as, as you're talking about this expansion uh, to the clients, uh, and I didn't I have to confess, I was unaware of this, but there are you know very strict like ingredients you know, restrictions in certain countries. You know, is, is that really what was the key that, you know, the, the proprietary blend that you're using could pass those metrics? Uh, uh, yes, it is very important. And one I'd left out and I should have mentioned is China. We're currently looking at an opportunity in China with food distribution people over there. And one of the things they really like about Hippie Chow is all of the ingredients are natural. There's nothing that we use that would conflict with any of their food standards or codes in China. And it's been the same for these other countries. Wow. Well, I mean, good ingredients make good products, right? There we go. Um, let me ask you, if I, if I may, you know, you're, so you're here in the kitchen. You know, we've seen all the, you know, the assets that, that they have to work here from, you know, blenders and ovens and things like that. You know, how vital or how important is this relationship you have, you know, with the shared kitchen to running of the business? Do you think you're going to be able to stay here for a while? Is this a, a starting and jumping off point to bigger uh, facilities? Well, these facilities are excellent. I've looked, uh, just for purpose of interest, I've looked around the country, and I believe this is one of the top facilities in the United States. Uh, you have the room, you have the space, you have the equipment, you have committed management that ensures that times are booked properly, the whole thing works smoothly. Uh, we have folks in here that do probably just a few thousand dollars a year to folks that are growing way beyond that now. But the center is capable of supporting that because of the way it's set up and the way it operates. It's just, I can't say enough about the people and the, the center. And I, and I understand, you know, the people part of that. Also, there's other resources, maybe other um, organizations, institutions that also provide, like, maybe business support or help? There are. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to take advantage of them yet, but I know others that are. One of the things I mentioned about China, uh, we coordinated with the University of Missouri, Kansas City. They have a business development group there, and they've been helpful with us with, and related to this international business, specifically China. So it's really kind of a community collaborative play. Absolutely. Well, I got to tell you, from a, a member of that community, I'm so thrilled that you had that support and you were able to continue to do this. It's a great product with, I'm sure, tremendous prospects. And I, I'm, I'm also equally certain that it's just a matter of time before we're going to read you on or see your chief hippie image on the cover of Fortune or Forbes or something like that. So thank you for making some time for us today. Thank you for being here. Hey, I'm here with Bruce Steinbeck of Vine Vines Artisanal Ketchup, and uh, as you can see, I'm tasting the product. I gotta tell you, I got the best job there is. We get to go on location for Top of Mind, and we're here today in the shared kitchen of the Innovation Center. 
and I'm meeting with Bruce, who's an incredible entrepreneur and has a great story of this, I mean, gourmet ketchup. I mean, is that, would that be a fair description? Yes, uh, but it takes ketchup to another role beyond being gourmet. It's artisanal, and the intent is to just literally change the ketchup market. You know, the ketchup market, to hear you use that phrase, and we met earlier over at the Coffin Foundation, you were mentioning how you are ostensibly reinventing like a, a stagnant, you know, condiment, namely ketchup. You know, you were saying there's hardly any choices and options compared to something like mustard. Yeah, how did you get to that epiphany that you saw that market opportunity? When I started making the ketchup, it was at home, uh, basically an outgrowth of my evolution in barbecue after moving to Kansas City and using ketchup for things like barbecue sauces and baked beans, you come to realize that if you are looking at your ingredients, the weakest link is actually the ketchup. So I started making some ketchup and then evolved it to go with a broader range of foods. And in the back of my mind, right from the beginning, was the notion that the ketchup market is rather one-dimensional. You have a number of brands and house brands, but they all have a very similar flavor. Even if you buy an organic one, they taste rather similar. So, and the flavor profile is very sweet, but not so strong on tomato or seasoning. And so, you're adding sweetness, not flavor, to food. Now, that's a, that's a key distinction here. Yes. Only somebody that's a foodpreneur would understand to say you're adding sweetness, but not flavor. Because I think for the uninitiated, sweetness is a flavor, isn't it? Perhaps so, but, okay. but but what I'm looking at with this product is the prominent flavor is tomato, and secondarily an evolution of seasoning as it goes around your mouth. I had a, a large uh, professional buyer here, but they say it transforms in your mouth. So oh, it does. You know, I mean, I'm a bit of a, a wine snob, right? And I like it for a lot of those reasons. You know, the bouquet and how it opens and tastes different. You know, this, you know. I, I, I almost am challenged to even call this ketchup. I don't know what, I mean, of course it is because the tomato will be in the base, but this is just, this is just kind of changed my whole notion. And then I look at all the flavors that you have here from, you know, the truffle, the, the sweet, the lemon twist, habanero, grill smoke. You know, tell me about like, what motivated you to come up with this, you know, these number of options and in, in the ingredients, because I know, you know, we spoke earlier about you know, the emphasis you placed on ingredients. And how's that evolved? How's that get to be where you're at with that? So the analogy to wine is rather apropos. The name fine vines connotes something about wines as well as tomato vines. Um, and the idea behind that name is the fact that the flavors pair well with foods like wine. Uh -huh. And there are choices of flavors to pair with different foods like wine. So the whole branding of this is designed so that the flavors become the prominent feature. That's why the labels are designed the way they are. And so that when consumers see this range of flavors on the shelf, they immediately start to think about what do those flavors go with and how can I use that in my kitchen, either as a serving on the side with a sandwich or to cook with or to dip with or to finish a, a grilling process. So the, the, the whole notion of that like a wine is very much the thought behind this product. Yeah, I, I gotta tell you, that's brilliant. That really is brilliant because if, if you were saying that and the motivation behind it, you know, I start thinking to myself, typically you think of ketchup, you think of basically two applications, right? Hamburgers, hot dogs, well, maybe french fries. But now I look at this and think, well, lemon twist, you know, I've never thought to put, let's say, ketchup, let alone something as tasty as this, on something like fish. Or compliment somebody. You could actually offer pairings. Yes. So the thought we had with the lemon twist was some kind of a white fish, like a tilapia, let's say, or a halibut, and it can be used as a sauce on the side. It can be used as a finishing glaze for cooking, uh, and it, it makes a terrific cocktail sauce for shrimp. Oh, I bet it would. I really bet it would. So you know, we're surrounded by your product in various states. Uh, you know, we have this little labeling making. We have this. And I saw back. Uh, on the back side of the, uh, the kitchen here, you know, big, is that a 50 gallon drum? 50 gallon drum. Of? Of uh, apple cider vinegar, sourced right here in Kansas City. Really, now why? Is that just because of convenience that it was local, or was there some other motivation that you, you selected the vinegar that you did? Convenience is a factor because of shipping costs. 
but the more prominent factor was flavor. Uh, this product is all about flavor, ingredients are key, and how it gets cooked is key, which is partly why I'm doing it here in terms of being able to control the entire process. But when I first was developing the product, I was using a uh, branded organic apple cider vinegar that was very expensive and too expensive to use as an ingredient. But I wanted the flavor that I was getting. And so I sourced samples from every vinegar manuf manufacturer really? in the country. There are some that are huge, that, that's, that actually produce for many other brands. And the company that I'm using now uh, is actually producing the apple cider vinegar here in Kansas City. But the, the flavor profile is more prominent tasting with apple flavor, as well as a softer acidity. And so that changes the nature of the product. It doesn't have as high of an acid note in the mouth. It's, it's more mellow and evolves in flavor. And, and that apple cider vinegar makes a difference. Another reason for using apple cider vinegar, uh, other than flavor, is that it makes the product 100% gluten-free. That's, that's important to the dietary restrictions. Yes. You were, you were mentioning kind of how it evolves in flavor. I want to take you, I talk for one moment about evolving the business. I think we were first introduced to you at a, another Kaufman program that we run called One Million Cups, where you were able to present at the, at the foundation, or it wasn't even a demo day maybe, um, that you were able to present. I, I'm wondering if I could ask you in a shameless you know, plug for things that we do at the foundation, like what was that experience like for you? You know, presenting it on a large stage, large form at, at, at a place like the Coffin Foundation. So the Coffin Foundation has played quite a bit of role uh, for me in that I moved to Kansas City because I was with a company that actually bought the Marion Legacy Organization. And so worked through this merged organization and certainly became well aware of the legacy of the Coffin family and all that they've done for Kansas City. When I started this business, I did the Fast Track program and found it to be excellent uh, at the UMKC site. And, uh, and then had, was, was asked to present at Demo Day back in June of 2012, which I believe was the first Demo Day uh, that was conducted there. And so presented, and, and it was a great experience. Lots of people gave some feedback. The Kansas City Business Journal picked up on a great online article title I want to do for catch up with great pundit for mustard. This points out a very um, common thing that story that I find in, in interviewing entrepreneurs like yourself that serendipity plays a big part of it. Yes. Um, certainly we've met with uh, several other entrepreneurs like yourself here at the Investor the Shared Kitchen today. Um, and you know I, I just want to thank you for the time you make and I, I want to I want to say let's let's aspire to have you as the next great coupon of the catch up uh, industry because I think this is going to revolutionize, as you've said, you know, an old condiment that's being rethought in a clever way. That's what entrepreneurs do. Thank you. I don't know how you do that. You just keep going. Yeah, I want to put this. Good. I'm here with founder Becky Ross of Freedom Chef. Becky, thank you for making time for us today in Thanks the for shared kitchen. Me. Thanks so much. So I'm looking at what is just an incredible display of what can only be described as some of the most nutritional food I've ever seen. Thank you, thank you, we think so. I mean, is, is this really like the essence of what, you know, Freedom Chef and your nutrition kitchen does? Can you explain that for the viewers at Top of Mind? It really is, it really is. A piece of our hearts are going out in every single box that comes to your home. So those are meals that are fresh, they're healthy, and they're delivered to your home twice a week. Really? Yes. Now, what inspired you to on this journey to make this commitment? I mean, you know, earlier today we met with uh, several foodpreneurs like yourself, but they had, you know, a singular specialty product. Right. You're making entire meals. Yeah. You know, what's the motivation behind that? Well, I tell you what, I saw a need and I decided that it was my mission in life to fulfill this need that people have. And what I do here out of the Innovation Center Kitchens is I run three different businesses. Three. And yes. And they're all related. Um, the Freedom Chef is really all about allergy-free, very complicated dietary needs. So I work with a lot of clinical dietitians, and they send me their complicated cases of people that think that they have no options of what they can eat. 
What, what kind of food complications are we talking about here? Oh, like the renal diet. Uh, lots of diabetics. Okay. Um, there's, there's so like glycemic like so indexes food. you have to worry about and things sure. like that? and food allergies. I've worked with up to 50 different food allergies in a single person. So it's wow. just about right, the right combination of food and putting it together in a helpful way. So not just alternatives or replacements of ingredients, but healthy replacements. And so then, do you offer, I mean, like ultra-customized menus, or is it like here are, you know, 10, if you're diabetic, here are 10 you can choose from? Well, actually, that's why Your Nutrition Kitchen came about, and that's actually what these meals are for. These go out to our clients throughout the entire metro area. We deliver them twice a week, so they're fresh meals. It's an entire 62-item menu to choose from, and every items. single item on this menu can be combined to be well under most dietary restrictions. So diabetics, would they could eat six meals a day and still be... Really? Well, within their limitations. Well, I got to tell you, you know, so we have this entire rack here. We were yeah. in the cooler earlier where I saw all these racks of food. Right. I mean, this is not insignificant. You have to be doing some serious volume here. Yeah, absolutely. We've done up to 500 meals in each delivery, so that's twice a week, up to 1,000 meals a week. And it's just, it's growing because people are realizing that we really care about every single ingredient that's going into these and that they're formulated specifically to promote weight loss, to promote lean muscle building, and to promote wellness all in one package. Well, if you're promoting weight loss, you've got a new client <laughs> in me for sure. Um, but you know, I gotta say, a thousand meals a week, I mean, you probably were like most entrepreneurs starting off like a single employee, right? But right, you're right. not making a thousand meals a week. I mean, there's been quite a job growth with this yes, venture absolutely. of yours. Yes, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, after culinary school, I was an executive chef and, and actually ended up quitting to have babies with my husband. So, had a couple kids and they ended up having some food allergies and sensitivities. So, that's what brought me back to the kitchen. And it really instilled this passion that I have to take um, all of my culinary education experience in real world cooking. Uh, for banquets of thousands. I was a banquet chef at one time. So there's a lot of history there. So I was able to take that and combine it with all of my, um, I call myself, I turned into a research geek. Okay. I'm just a mad scientist in the kitchen. And I started Wait, a research geek working yeah. in a kitchen? Yes, exactly. And it was really about my children, you know, my babies. I, and I so that's relate. what brought it home and, and just... I saw there was such a need out there for people who needed the same thing. And it was about replacing the bad with healthy alternatives and just bringing the nutrition level just way up, way up. as high as it could possibly be. Well, in that pursuit, you also brought up the employee headcount. Yes. I mean, where are yes. you now we, from where we you went started? went from me, just me, to 13 employees now. In how long of a time frame? Really, it's been in about the last 90 days. People are, are excited about what's days, going on. 90 people, 90 days. I mean, this is the, you know, this is what we talk about at the Coffin Foundation all the time, yeah, the, you know, yeah. the economic output from entrepreneurial activity. Yes, yes. I mean, so I mean that's gotta be satisfying to see that there's people that have, are making their living in pursuit of your vision. Uh, it, it's so honoring. I, I couldn't be more honored by the fact that um, what started out in my kitchen for, for my two kids has now grown into job development. It's grown into helping people because that's really the, the core passion here. Sure. And it is instilled in all of the employees. We all care so much about every single meal that goes out for every person that's going to eat it. Well, I got to tell you, speaking of being honored, it was my honor that you joined us today on Top of Mind. I thank you for it. Thank I want to wish you all the continued success. Thank I'm sure so we'll be watching you with great interest. Um, yeah, just another incredible entrepreneurial example that's happening here at the Shared Kitchen of the Innovation Center. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Tom.